What's cracking, YouTube? Welcome back to the channel. It's your boy Nicholas. We are here with Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football. Y'all know the rules. Got my championship ring on today. Things are gonna be good. It's gonna be a good episode. It's gonna be a good video. What y'all think of the new setup? I flipped the desk around. So now you got my room in the back. We got, make sure y'all are accounted for. Make sure you, you, you ain't slacking. We got Chance in the back looking over me, making sure I'm not slacking. We got all things coming full circle here. It's a beautiful setup. I think this is how I'm gonna do it from now on. Today, we are talking about free agency. Since it's basically wrapped up, we know most of the big players and where they're going, what their role is gonna be. And uh, I wanted to talk about some of the top guys. Now, I'm not gonna include every single guy in here. I'm not gonna talk about guys that I, I didn't like the move. Like for instance, Sammy Watkins is not in this list because I don't particularly like him on Kansas City next year. But these are guys that I just really like the move and I think they'll be a big impact for fantasy football purposes and that's what I'm going to do today. I did do one on the Browns moves like Jarvis Landry, Tyler Taylor, all that kind of shit in a completely separate video which I broke down pretty in depth so you can go watch that shit right there, right now. What else? What else? What else? Oh, so, you know, I talked about this on Twitter a little bit. If any of you guys, and, and in one of my last videos, if any of you guys are interested in blogging, fantasy football blogging for me on my website this summer, I want to bring on a few bloggers that can help me out, put out more content, you know, give you a platform obviously. If you're interested in doing fantasy football blogging, if you think you're good at it, if you think you got what it takes, shoot me an email. My email will be listed below. It's the one that ends in B-D-G-E-A-T. I actually uh, rebranded my website too. That's no longer the name. It's, it's just bigdogsfantasy.com. So that's gonna be a lot easier for people to find. Anywho, let's jump into the numbers. All the ADPs I have are from draft.com or dra you know the draft app. So these are all cash leagues. So usually they're more accurate than like fantasy football calculator and what I've been using. Use promo code BDGE when you sign up for draft to get a free entry into something. I don't know. Play that music, baby. Alright, so first up, we're going to start with the quarterbacks. Actually, this is the only quarterback I put on this list, and that's Kirk. Kirky Kirky. Captain Kirk, three years, $84 million, fully guaranteed. Whoop! Whoop! I wonder if he screamed, you like that, when he signed it. Like, when he was like, you like that? And, like, the owner of the team was like... Shit the fuck down. Like, you know what? We don't, we're not signing you anymore. This was kind of the perfect landing spot for Captain Kirk, all things considered, and where the openings were, right? He's got Diggs there. He's got Thielen, one of the best receiving young duos in the league on the outside. He's got Kyle Rudolph, a really reliable red zone target. He's got Dalvin Cook coming back, a really unique weapon coming out of the backfield. Uh, so he's got tons of weapons there. Kirk is turning 30 years old, so that's, you know, that could definitely be, I'm taking this shit off, the prime <coughs> uh, car prime career-wise for a quarterback. 30 is not old by any means. Uh, he has three straight 4,000-yard passing seasons. Every year, he continues to get drafted lower and lower. His ADP right now is 76 overall, QB 9. He has outplayed that basically every year over the last few years, and I'm sure he'll do that again this year. You know, what I like, obviously, most about the spot is the weapons that he has. But particularly, like, you know, you, it's easy to say, like, oh, he's got great weapons. But we've seen Kirk use each one of these types of weapons before, right? He has Diggs and Thielen. You look back at 2016 when he had d and Garcon, two capable outside receivers. Both went over 1,000 yards, right? So he's shown that he can, he can work with two different good wide receivers. In the same year, Jamison Crowder was right behind them with 847 receiving yards. So he spreads the love around. You look at a good red zone tight end like Rudolph. Is anyone else in here old enough to remember Jordan Reed? It was a really good tight end once. I think it was back in 2015 when he was healthy. That was with Kirk Cousins. He posted an 87, 952, 11 touchdown stat line back in 2015. And you look at Cousins' splits with and without Reed. I didn't count 2017 because Reed didn't play a lot. And when he did, he was only playing in like 20 to 30% of the snaps. So I kind of just took that off the list. This is 2015, 2016. You look at the numbers. Cousins averaged almost 50 passing yards more, three more completions, and over a half a touchdown more per game with a guy like Reed in there. Now, obviously, Kyle Rudolph isn't the athlete that Reed is, but he is uh, an actual end zone target, and that's something that Cousins rarely had. Uh, Reed was good for a while there. Doxson is a guy that showed that he could do that last year, and that kind of helped Cousins. But otherwise, besides those two guys, he's never had someone like that. So Reed, uh, Cousins, and, and Rudolph should work well together in the, in the red zone. And then lastly, you have Dalvin Cook. I feel like all I need to say is Chris Thompson, 2017. CT Crunch, 
dominated for Kirk Cousins. He was a league winner last year before he got hurt. Kirk relied on him. Kirk relied on guys like Reed. And he showed that he could use multiple outside receivers to accumulate his stats and his numbers. So, you know, it, like I said, it, it's easy to just say, like, oh, he's got a lot of weapons now. But that doesn't always translate. The good thing about Kirk, I think, is that we will see it translate because he's done it before with all these types of players. Of course, his offense is definitely more conservative in uh, Minnesota than it was in Washington, and the defense will be very stout, so it's possible that the volume for Kirk in terms of passing attempts goes down, but I think what he'll lose in passing attempts he'll more than make up for in efficiency um, and how many red zone opportunities that this team is going to have and, ha you know, just, just their overall scoring. So he's an easy QB one for me in 2018. That was the only QB I put on. I could have talked about Case Keenum and shit, but honestly, I was too lazy making this. Wide receivers. If you enjoyed that little Kirk piece, give this video a thumbs up, please. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. I love y'all. Uh, wide receivers. We got A-Rob going to Chicago. ADP right now of 60. Wide receiver, 24. This was a uh, this was an interesting one. It's three years, 42 million. So a little less than Sammy Watkins actually got. You know, most people get really, really, really rowdy and excited about free agency wide receiver moves. They think it's kind of like Madden, you know, you simply just plug and play and his statistics will just be there and all of his, everything just works perfectly. It's usually not the case, right? When you look at free agency and you look at wide receivers particularly and, and them moving, one of two things usually needs to happen, or usually it's both of them, but one of these two things has to happen. One, there either needs to be an opportunity increase, two, there needs to be an upgrade at quarterback. Now, the obvious one here is the opportunity increase, going to Chicago they have basically, I think it was like, let me see, 225 targets and about 2,000 air yards available from last year's team. That's per Roto World. There's basically no 0% chance that uh, that Robinson isn't the wide receiver one here, and he's going to get a ton, a ton, a ton of looks. So the opportunity is there. Uh, the question then becomes Mitch Trubisky. Now, Blake Bortles by no means was great, but he was good the year that Allen Robinson put up 1,400 yards. The other thing that's like weird is like, you know, like A-Rob had that crazy year. And then all of a sudden he had like a down, a weird random down year. Like why did the numbers dip so low at coming off a really good year? And then he got hurt last year, so we didn't know how he was going to perform. But it's it's two seasons in a row where you're not seeing high-level production out of Robinson, and that's where like a red flag kind of comes in. But you have to love, you know, the opportunity here, and he's going to be one of the only guys on the outside that, that Trubisky can actually throw the ball to. We have to see what happens with Cameron Meredith. They tendered him, but another team can offer him more money. Uh, so that hasn't been settled yet, but we're looking at some of Trubisky's numbers from last year. Under 60% completion percentage, 7-7 to -7 touchdown interception ratio. His completion percentage ranked 30th among NFL quarterbacks. Nowadays, like, it's so easy to write people off quickly, like people did with Jared Goff, and, you know, every year it's the same thing. If they don't produce within the first, like, four games, they're a bust. So with Trubisky, I'm absolutely not ready to say that he is, because um, we didn't really see anything out of him last year. You know, he was a rookie. He had almost nothing to work with in terms of in weapons, right? In t there was no one to throw the ball to. It was almost impossible for him to get in a groove considering like the low volume of pass attempts that they let him throw, right? I think it was, let me see. He threw the ball 25 times or less in five of 12 games last year. 25 times or less is like nothing for a quarterback. That's just attempts, that's not completions. So 25 times or less, like it, it's impossible to get into a groove when you're not really throwing the ball and you're giving the ball to Jordan Howard 38 times a game. You know, the storyline this offseason seems to be that the Bears are reloading, right? They got they brought in Matt Nagy as their Nagy or Nagy? I don't know. Matt Nagy as their as their their head coach, who was the previous offensive coordinator for the Chiefs. So you expect him to know how to use offensive weapons. And they brought in Trey Burton. They brought in Allen Robinson. They have Tariq Cohen back there. So I, I would expect Trubisky to definitely improve, especially in his statistical numbers, right? I was looking at player profile for Trubisky. He was ranked pretty awful in just about every passing category that they had on there. Uh, money throws, air yards per attempt, uh, true completion percentage, red zone completion percentage, pressure completion, completion percentage, true passer rating, etc., he did rank 11th in uh, deep ball completion percentage, which, you know, that doesn't outweigh all the shitty things he did, but that's good for Allen Robinson. Um, one, because Robinson's already going to get the opportunities down in the red zone and near the end zone because he's basically all they have outside of Trey Burton right now. But Robinson made his money in 2015, whatever that big year was, he made a lot of his money on deep throws and a lot of big plays down the sideline. So if, if Trubisky can develop into a good deep passer, we're going to see Allen Robinson have a very, very, very good year. So for me, it all really lies in Trubisky's uh, development. You know, as it stands, I'm perfectly okay. And I would probably jump at the opportunity to draft Allen Robinson where he is right now at pick 60. 
Uh, I don't think he's going to stay there. We'll we'll probably see him start dipping a little lower and lower. And obviously, the lower that ADP dips, the riskier and riskier he gets. You know, we had we we know the talent. We know he had the big season. One knock on him when I, I remember reading a few articles is like he doesn't perform well against good cornerbacks. Like he always took advantage of really bad ones and then struggled a lot against good cornerbacks. And I'm looking at you know their their division. Who do you have? The Packers, the Lions, the the Vikings. So the Packers are nothing, right? Their cornerback group is awful. It's going to take them years to rebuild that. But he will get Xavier Rhodes twice a year. He will get Darius Slay twice a year. So that's like a quarter of your season right there. A quarter of the regular season. That could that might be like 35% of your fantasy season, depending on what weeks they play. So that's tough matchup for him. Again, it's opportunity versus talent at this point. Um, he's really young still, 24, turning 25 in August. So the upside is absolutely huge. And there's just going to, you know, there's going to be a lot of opportunity there. So I'm okay with Robinson. I, I think people are going to start taking him at the end of the third round, probably early fourth round. I would rather take him in the fourth round, of course. I'm not sure I'm going to leap into the third because I just don't know if I want to risk it on a, on, a, on a quarterback that hasn't really shown us anything. That's where I'm at with Robinson. Next wide receiver. Again, you know, I didn't put Sammy Watkins in here. I didn't put some of the bigger name guys. Who I put in here? Paul Richardson. He's like one of my favorite players in the NFL. He goes to the Redskins five years, $40 million, currently being picked as wide receiver 60, like one, 160 overall, basically undrafted. Kind of out of control, the money that he got, five years, 40 million compared to like what was on the market. But I like what, what Richardson brings to this offense and brings to Alex Smith. You know, Smith loses a guy like Terry Kill, and, and Paul Richardson is obviously not the guy Terry Kill is. The Redskins also lose Terrell Pryor, so there's opportunities to be had there. It's still a little messy. Uh, but he is a field stretcher, right? He is someone that can take those deep balls. He's also someone who could win jump balls, contested catches, and things like that. His raw numbers are super impressive, right? 4 4 40, great explosive ability, can get up and snag the ball out of the air. I almost think he's a poor man's AJ Green. He's a little smaller, uh, so it's not as easy to kind of label him as, as like a top wideout, but I think he'll I think he'll eventually get a lot of opportunity in Washington. He set career highs last year uh, with 44 catches, 703 yards, six touchdowns, and that was operating as the number two wide receiver. I was looking more in depth at, at the player profile numbers. Uh, Richardson ranked last year sixth in total air yards. He was top 10 in both average depth of targets and yards per reception, 14th in QB rating when targeted among all NFL wide receivers, 21st in fantasy points per target. 11th in production premium, which is more of like a real life stat, like how well you performed in, in clutch situations. And he was tied for 18th in the NFL among all wide receivers in both receptions of 20 plus yards and 40 plus yards. So a lot of the numbers tell me, what they tell me is he's an explosive athlete, that he puts up numbers, but he doesn't get the volume. He hasn't gotten the opportunity. That being said, like, will he? on the Redskins, right? We have Jamison Crowder there. We have Chris Thompson coming back. We have Josh Doxson and we have Jordan Reed. Realistically, Jamison Crowder is kind of my only concern here because we've seen him develop into a good wide receiver in the NFL. I wouldn't expect Paul Richardson to be the wide receiver one there. Who else we got? We got Chris Thompson, CT Crunch. So I'm worried about him to an extent. He saw like 14.7, almost 15% of the Redskins targets while he was there for his 10 games last year, which is a pretty big number, but they just don't share the same target. The targets that they get are completely different. It's not like if those weren't going to CT, they'd be going to Richardson, right? So that's, I'm not really worried about that. Doxson has really proved nothing outside of being a end zone target or an end zone threat. He's made a few good plays here and there, but he, all he did was really score touchdowns and he would put up like 35 yards a game with that. So he, he needs to develop before I'm even somewhat scared of, of him taking targets away. And then we have Jordan Reed who will probably honestly be hurt by the time this video goes up on YouTube. I don't know. Alex Smith was never a great deep passer, but he was actually phenomenal last year. He ranked first in just about every deep ball category. And of course, I know I'm not an idiot. That was like 98% due to Tyree Kill just being an incredible athlete and a deep threat um, in an NFL offense. So at the same time, like, would you rather Alex Smith have ranked shitty? Like, it's not his fault. He was the number one ranked deep passer, even if it was Tyree Kill. So I'd rather him, him have ranked like that than not. So I think it's a good thing for Paul Rich that, that Alex Smith, maybe, maybe he gained more confidence in his deep ball going forward and he's looking to prove people wrong and he wants to take those deep shots. Paul Rich will be that guy if he decides to do so. So, I mean, I'm not, I'm not predicting a breakout for Paul Rich by any means. Um, but the move certainly intrigues me. Crowder is my favorite fantasy wide receiver still in Washington. Uh, but between Chris Thompson and Jordan Reed's injury history, 
uh, there could be room for some pretty high volume of targets for Paul Richardson. Please give the video a thumbs up if you're enjoying, and let me check that the camera's still on before we move on to running backs. Yeah, we gooch. Ooh, we only have 17 minutes. That's a saw. That's a saw. A saw, dude. Nakam, Ndamukong saw, dude. That you know was ridiculous. Like, Ndamukong Sue is obviously visiting all these teams now because um, he he's not signed. He goes to the Rams. Like, I don't understand the NFL. Like, I really don't. He goes to the Rams. And if you put Ndamukong Sue next to Aaron Donald, isn't that, like, game over? Like, maybe I don't know anything about real football. Maybe all I do is look at numbers for fantasy. But how does, like, the number one and arguably the number two tackles next to each other not result in just absolute dominance? Like, I don't get it. Why just If you have the money, sign Sue right now. You can make a Super Bowl run, right? They brought him Peters. They, they got uh, Marcus Joyner back. They tagged him. Uh, who else did they bring in? They brought in someone else at cornerback, I think, didn't they? I can't remember. But, like... I saw like an NFL guy tweet. He has like a hundred thousand followers, and he's like in the NFL. He's like, "This is a terrible. This perplexes me. If they were to sign and Dominican so, dude, they need edge rushers. Like, if Donald and Sue are running up the middle, that would occupy like four fifths of the offensive line. Therefore, your edge rushers don't even have to be good. They just have to be able to walk. I don't know. Maybe I'm may, maybe someone who actually knows the NFL can explain this to me better. I don't think I'll ever get this shit. Anyways, uh, let's move on to the running backs. And I've been talking about him a lot, especially on my Instagram. So if you uh, if you're not following me on Instagram, I do I, I put a lot of stats on I, that I don't tweet out or put in my YouTube videos. So follow me on Instagram, bdge underscore fantasy football. First running back is Jarek McKinnon, San Francisco 49ers. His current ADP is all out of whack. It's like RB 33. 110th overall, but that's just because no, you know, up until a week ago, we didn't know where he was going to be. Anyway, he signs a four year, $30 million contract, fourth highest among all NFL running backs. That, I mean, that's kind of says it all in terms of how they plan to use him. Shanny, Kyle Shanahan absolutely loves McKinnon. The reports I was reading was, you know, him just talking about how much he can do with McKinnon and all these parts of his game that, that he loves and he's going to be able to utilize. There is something that stood out to me, and again, I put this out on Instagram yesterday, is what's going to make the difference for me in terms of where I want to draft McKinnon. And it's, you know, well, the NFL obviously is turning into a league where you need to utilize your running backs in in the receiving game, right? You've seen uh, Shanahan dominate doing that in, in the previous seasons. You see New England do it all the time. The bad coaches in the NFL don't utilize their running backs in the passing game until it's the third down. The teams that seem to do well and know how to utilize their running backs and the great offensive minds use that passing that part of the passing game on first and second downs, right? And that's why you had a guy like Devonta Freeman go bonkers with Shanahan because they use him so well in the passing game. That's where I think McKinnon is going to explode this year. I, I think the like Listen, he's small, and I know the argument against him is going to be like he's undersized, and then people are going to be like, well, Devonta Freeman did it. Well, listen, Devonta Freeman's a fucking animal. I don't know how he still stays on his feet, but McKinnon's not anywhere near as strong inside, like in the core, as Freeman is. Freeman takes on guys head on, but that's not McKinnon's game. So this is, you know, this is, this is what I'm getting at. McKinnon had a career-high 51 receptions last year, which was 14th among running backs. He barely played the first four games of the season because... You know, Dalvin Cook was the starter there. You look at Carlos Hyde, who he's a capable receiving back. He's not a bad athlete by any means, but it's definitely not his strength. Hyde caught 59 balls, which was sixth in the NFL among running backs. His 88 targets were fifth. Look at his yards per reception, though. 5.9. McKinnon's was 8.3. McKinnon's yards after the catch, 9.2. Hyde's 5.7. It just tells you that... McKinnon is way more suited for the passing game. He moves way better in space and with the ball in his hands. And that is what this offense, and that is what Shanahan is going to do for this offense. Now, I was, okay, this is the stat I need to get around. So I was I was looking at a Sharp Will. I forget what the guy's name is. William Sharp or something. I have it. I'll link it down below. He has this crazy website where he's got like every stat for every game, every first down, third down, whatever. Uh, I was looking at pass run ratios for teams on different downs. So on on first and second downs, the percentage of plays where San Francisco threw the ball was 56%, which was fifth highest in the NFL. Minnesota threw the ball on first and second downs 41% of the time, which was 29th in the NFL. So if you're looking at a team that throws the ball a ton on first and second down versus a team that does not. And McKinnon still wound up with 51 receptions. They're going to, like, you don't, it does, McKinnon doesn't have to be on the field for all three downs because they know how to use him on the first two. That's the point I'm trying to get across to you guys. That 15% difference in 
plays that you pass the ball on first and second down equates to 80 extra pass attempts uh, overall in the year, which equates to like 15 extra targets for the running back. Like it's all this stuff. And McKinnon is just, you know, he's going to be the guy there too. There's not anything in the backfield that he has to worry about. Like Matt Breida was a, a good RB2 punch to Hyde. Joe Williams is coming back, but they clearly brought in McKinnon with the money that they're giving him. He is going to fit so well in this offense, I think. All the reports are saying he's going to play the Devonta Freeman role. You look at what Freeman did under Shanahan 2015, 2016. In 31 games, I want you to listen to this, a two-year span, 31 games, Freeman put up 3180 total yards, 3180 total yards, 27 touchdowns, 127 receptions in 31 games. Now, that was with Tevin Coleman having a pretty sizable portion of those touches. I don't know. You look at McKinnon, he's just 25, right? You want to say, like, oh, he's had his chance as a feature back. But he's super young, and he hasn't really had that chance. You look at the the years when he had the chance was in Minnesota. Do you remember how bad that uh, – the Minnesota offensive line was, like, the punchline joke of the NFL, of the running backs for, like, for like two or three years. And McKinnon was a part of that. So even Adrian Peterson could barely get it going in, in terms of like yards per carry and stuff. So I don't think McKinnon ever got a fair chance there. Um, so I'm I'm excited to see him. He's going to turn 26 in May. No, he's a great spot behind Jimmy G under 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 Kyle Shanny. I'm looking at him as a top 10 back in PPR leagues, probably like top seven if not. So I love this move here. I don't necessarily like a lot of the other moves that were made in free agency for running backs. I mean, obviously, Le'Veon Bell being franchises, whatever, is fine. If you want to talk more in depth about any of these guys, let me know again. You know, leave a comment. You have Hyde going to Cleveland. I like Hyde. I think he's a good talent, but, like, he made most of his money last year off of catching the ball in receptions, and he's not going to get that opportunity with Duke Johnson there in Cleveland. So his numbers are going to go down a lot. Deion Lewis, I love Deion Lewis, obviously. He's, I, I love Lou God. I love my boy Lou Gad, but like Tennessee, you couldn't have found a worse landing spot for Tennessee. How are you going to pair him with Derrick Henry? I honestly expect Deion Lewis to come away as the as the top fantasy PPR back in that backfield by the year by the end of the year. The type of money they gave him says that they're going to use him pretty heavily. I, I don't love that move for fantasy football. It sucks. I would love to have seen Henry and Lewis both get their own opportunity to at least. Neither of that, like, you you would think Henry at least would have the first two downs in 2018. He doesn't even own both of those downs now. You never know how they're going to use Lewis, so I don't know. I, I expect big things from Lewis, but my second favorite RB move was actually not a move. And it was Deion Lewis's former teammate of the Patriots. Re-signing Rex Burkhead. Flex Burkhead. Rex Goathead. Sexy Rexy. I love Rex Burkhead. So they signed him to a three-year... $9.75 million contract, if I have that correct. $5.5 million guaranteed, which is a lot for a Patriots running back. Now, I, I think a big reason that, that the pa the Patriots let Deion Lewis go in the first place was obviously they couldn't afford to pay him and match that offer sheet, but they weren't anxious to get him back because they have a guy like Burkhead who doesn't make Deion Lewis redundant because Deion Lewis is definitely a better runner on the inside. Burkhead has a lot of the same assets and a lot of the same talent that, that Lewis has, right? In terms of being able to play on all three downs. He can run the ball. He can catch the ball out of the backfield and moves really well with the ball in his hands. So that's, you know, I, I think Burkhead is a really good replacement for Lewis. I mean, look at Burkhead's numbers last year. He played in just 10 games. He had 518 total yards, 30 catches, and eight touchdowns in just 10 games. If you pace that out to a 16-game season, that gives you 830 total yards, 48 catches, and 12.8 touchdowns. So 13 touchdowns, 830, 48 catches, 13 touchdowns over a 16-game pace. That would have landed him as RB13 in half PPR leagues, right behind Jordan Howard. He was splitting time with James White last year. He was splitting time with Deion Lewis. He was splitting time with Mike Gillisley in the beginning of the year. And obviously, there's going to be a lot more in that backfield that changes between now and the beginning of the season. Gillisley and Jeremy Hill are going to battle for probably a spot in that lineup. James White is still there. I, yeah, I'm pretty sure he signed through 2018. Uh, but we saw, I think, Burkhead kind of take over that passing role. He was almost operating as a slot receiver. Danny Amendola's gone now. Ju they will get Julian Edelman back, though. I forgot about that. That's interesting. But I guess, you know, Julian Edelman kind of just takes up where Danny Amendola was. I think Burkhead almost makes Gillisley redundant because Burkhead was very good inside near the goal line. He had the second most goal line rushes on the team just behind Mike Gillisley. So Burkhead had seven rushes, seven goal line rushes. Gillisley had eight. And like fucking six of them came in that first game where he scored three touchdowns on opening night. But they brought in Jeremy Hill. Same story. Jeremy Hill's been awful over the last couple of years. Them two are going to fight out for a spot. But Burkhead is clearly with the guaranteed money they gave him. He is he is a, a big option there. Uh, he, he plays well down by the goal line. He cat I think that's also a really important part is just that he catches a lot of passes too. Um, super involved when he's on the team. 
and they had him out on the field a, a, a lot to do. You know, he's one of those guys you can put out in defenses, can't cheat because he offers so much to an offense. So, I mean, I'm not, and, and most importantly, he didn't lose any fumbles last year. Huge. I'm not predicting like a, a Deion Lewis down the stretch type breakout for Burkhead, but at, where is he going right now? 95 overall running back 32 Burkhead is. I think he's, I think Goathead's going to be a monster value in PPR leagues. Like I will, if he's at that ADP when the drafts come, I will own him in every league. What else we got? What else we got? Oh, tight ends, tight ends, tight ends, tight ends. Okay. Start with Trey Burton, Chicago. Shy town, shy rat, kill a noise. Bears sign him to revamp this offense. And we kind of talked about that, right? He's going right now at like 170, tight end 25. He'll probably be picked inside the top 14 tight ends when uh, when drafts really come around. Big money, four years, $32 million. Um, I don't hate the landing spot at all because they're an offense, you know, trying to put weapons in there, but it's not the best because they have a guy there named Adam Sheehan. Some of you guys know him, um, and he was like an early pick. I think it was a second round pick for them. Also, it was like the old old team, old regime, whatever you want to say. So who knows if, if, you know, they have the new head coach, Matt Nagy, coming over from Kansas City. And here's a here's a few stats I, I want to throw out there. Since Nagy is the former Chiefs offensive coordinator, he was responsible for helping to design the Chiefs offense that utilized multiple tight end packages on 378 plays in 2017, fifth most in the NFL. KC also ran an offense which topped the league in tight end target rate each of the last two seasons. In this Nagy offense, right, assume, you know, you have Sheehan there, and I don't think they cut Deion Sims yet, but Deion Sims is way more impactful as a blocker, so he's not going to be their receiving back. The only worry I have is with Sheehan down by the goal line, right? With Nagy here, they, you know, he knows how to use his, his tight ends, right? He created Travis Kelsey. Travis Kelsey's parents created him, of course, but Nagy was like, Throw a little seasoning in that bitch and, and make you all pro, you know? So maybe he sees that in Trey Burton and he's going to know how to utilize him considering they give him that type of money. So um, again, it, it comes down to Trubisky's kind of development. And I think that there's an, a lot of opportunity for Burton. My my worry is Burton is good by the end zone, but Sheehan is actually very good by the end zone as well. Burton's undersized. He's like 6'3", 235, I think. And Sheehan is like 6'6", or 6'7", 280. So he's a huge, 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 huge target down there. Now, if you're a tight end, for the most part, uh, outside of like the elite, elite guys, like the Kelseys, the Gronks, uh, things like that, you are touchdown dependent, right? The guys who are truly elite are the ones that can create yards and the ones that catch a lot of balls. Outside of that, like tight ends five through 10 every year are pretty much touchdown dependent for the most part, which will lead into Jimmy Graham next. But um, if Burton is not getting those touchdowns, I'm definitely going to be a little weary of that. So we'll have to see. I, th I think what's going to be a big teller is during the preseason, we see how they utilize Burton and Sheehan near the end zone and near the red zone. So that'll be interesting. And like I just said, Jimmy Graham got that three-year 30 mil. He's the highest paid tight end right now on a per-year basis, 10 mil a year. Just fucking like wrong. He's going tight end six right now, 64 overall. There's a lot to talk about here. The sides of this argument are going to be People against Graham are going to say that, you know, Aaron Rodgers and the Packers never used their tight end historically. This is the, the argument every every summer. Oh, they don't use their tight end position uh, ever, really. Historically, they just never used it. And then someone will be like, well, this is the most athletic tight end that they've ever had and Rodgers has had. So the last 10 tight ends the Packers have had have been the most athletic tight ends that they've ever had, according to every single person every summer. So Jimmy Graham, again, people are going to make that same argument. This is the best tight end he's ever had to work with. Might be true, but it, that wasn't the case last year. He was a shell of himself last year. He finished a tight end four in fantasy because he scored 10 touchdowns. Tight end four in fantasy, he was 10th in receptions, 17th in receiving yards, 57 receptions, 520 receiving yards. That touchdown total is what kept him afloat. Like I just said, the top, top elite tight ends are the guys that create on their own. Touchdowns usually fluctuate on a year-to-year -year basis. They don't stay the same. If you have a really good high year in touchdowns, there's a good chance that that number is going to dip down. And there's a good chance that happens with Jimmy Graham. I was listening to a podcast the other day, Adam Leviton. If you don't listen to him, I highly suggest following him on Twitter, listening to his stuff. He put it a great way. He said, basically said, Jimmy Graham is going to be a goal line back for the Packers. I think that is so accurate. Like, I, I wouldn't surprise me him to score double-digit touchdowns again, but he is not the 20, between the 20s Jimmy Graham that he was in New Orleans. He could not, he could barely move last year if you actually watched him play. He was bad. Um, his yards per reception dipped from 14.2 
to 9.1, over five yards dips in dip in yards per reception from 2016 to 2017. His 3.7 yards after the catch ranked 57th among 69 qualified tight ends last year. So he doesn't move well after the catch. And that's where he's basically ranked each of the last few years. So he'll turn 32 this year and you could see it in his play. It speaks to it in the numbers. He will score those touchdowns. And that's the thing. I'm staying away from Graham if it's a PPR league. I will not be picking him. Standard league, I like Graham because there's, you know, it's a coin flip, if, if not more of a percentage to score a touchdown with Aaron Rodgers there. Jimmy Graham, the basketball player, the former basketball player, is not there anymore. He's not the same guy. So that's kind of where I sit on Jimmy Graham. In a full PPR league, I honestly might take Trey Burton over Jimmy Graham. TBD, to be determined. We got to wait for the summer. Um, and that's really it for all the skill players. I wrote that. I was going to start writing down some non skill players, but that would have taken too long. Andrew Norwell, the left guard for. Now the Jacksonville Jaguars. Huge boost for this O-line. He was one of the top guards in the NFL last year. He was like, let me see. He was the third overall guard according to Pro Football Focus last year. Just behind Zach Martin, David DeCastro of the Steelers. He was number one in pass blocking and eighth in run blocking. The Jaguars already were 13th best in run blocking and fifth best in pass blocking per football outsider. So they're getting a boost to a part of their team that played really well already last year. So this is going to be great for Leonard Fournette. And the more I think about Fournette, the more he just keeps creeping up my my draft board. I think at this point I would take him at six over DeAndre Hopkins. So that's really going to wrap up the video. So I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, make sure you give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. Uh, if you're interested, again, if you're interested in blogging, please shoot me over an email. It's nick.urcolano at bdgeat.com. You'll see that in, in the description below. These beautiful rings, belts, trophies from fantasyjocks.com. Also a link down below. Um, if you do fantasy baseball, obviously they do draft boards for fantasy baseball and belts and rings and stuff for that too. So check that out. I got an exciting announcement actually for a partnership with me and Fantasy Jocks, which I will probably release in the next coming weeks or so. But stay tuned for that. Otherwise, again, hope you all enjoyed. Subscribe, like it up, and I'll see you all next week.